Hello, everyone. My name is Calandra Waters-Lake, Executive Director of Wild Virginia. Thank you all for joining us. As many of you know, Wild Virginia is a statewide conservation nonprofit. We work through advocacy, influence, and education to protect and connect Virginia's wild places. We focus on two main areas, water quality, such as the Mountain Valley Pipeline and forever chemicals known as PFAS, as well as habitat connectivity, such as wildlife crossings and corridors. If you'd like to learn more about what we do later on, please visit our website, and I hope you'll consider donating to continue making this work possible. Today, it is my honor to introduce our new Habitat Connectivity Director, Dr. Jessica Roberts. Jessica has over 10 years of experience in wildlife research and recovery, advocacy, and community-based conservation. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from American University, she began her career working with AmeriCorps as the Watershed Restoration Coordinator for a conservation nonprofit in California. Jessica was inspired to pursue a graduate degree after working in wildlife conservation at the Wildlife Center of Virginia and as the Red Brown Amazon Recovery Program Lead at Zoo Tampa. Jessica earned her PhD at George Mason University, focused on captive management techniques that could improve the success of those reintroduced to the wild. Jessica, we are thrilled to have you on the Wild Virginia team. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Calandra. I'm super excited to be here and to give this presentation to you all. So I'm first uh, going to go over the PhD research I did, and I actually did it here in Virginia. And then I am going to discuss just a little bit about the Habitat Connectivity Program, and then we can open it up for questions. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me a moment. Okay. Can everybody see this? Everybody? It looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to go over the first parts, raising endangered birds for success. And here we go. So just to give you guys a little bit of background information where my ideas for this research came from. So I know this looks like a really intimidating graph, but just it's actually very descriptive and really, really helpful when we talk about threats to biodiversity. If you look at these bars um, down here on the left side, the black and the gray ones, this is the extinction extinction rates per million species year. So this is basically just a extinction rate. This is the normal background rate of extinction. And if you look at the pink and red bars, this is recent historical rates of extinction. So what this is telling us is basically we are at a, there's always a normal background rate of extinction, but today due to lots of human effects, we are experiencing a very high rate of extinction. And it is estimated to be anywhere from 100 to 10,000 times the normal background rate of extinction. Specifically for birds, 13% of bird species are threatened with extinction thanks to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's really wonderful IUCN red list where they, they monitor all the species that are listed and what their extinction rates are. So about 13% of birds are threatened with extinction. But however, if we look a little bit closer, even if a bird is not threatened with extinction, it still has some kind of, um, it may have one or two declining populations. And when we look at this as a whole, um, around 50% of birds have some kind of declining population. In North America specifically, um, there's a really cool but also kind of depressing study that came out recently that said, if we talk about bird abundance, we're looking at a 3 billion bird net loss of abundance compared to the 1970s look at bird abundance in the United States. So really, really depressing and frustrating. Um, and the main causes of this, land use change, invasive species, and climate change. So what can we do about this? Some of the main um, things that we can do that are actually very effective are things like protecting the areas, the native range of these species. This includes both their wintering and breeding grounds if they are migratory. Uh, doing some kind of habitat management or restoration where the species, again, breed winter. 
and invasive species control. This is one of the major threats to the <clears throat> to the populations. Bringing the species into captivity, whether this be the rest of the species left in the wild, bringing them all, all those individuals into captivity, or just bringing a safeguard population into captivity to do some kind of, um, again, that safeguard population, um, some breeding control, and, um, and then potentially releasing them back out into the environment for what's called a conservation translocation. And I will go over this term in just a second. For my presentation today, I'm focusing on these two. What happens when we captive breed birds and we send them back out into the wild? So just to go over some terminology, what is a conservation translocation? The general term from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, they have this conservation translocation specialist group, and they claim that the main definition of this is the deliberate movement of organisms from one location to be released into another for intended conservation benefits. They have this really lovely translocation spectrum that, and I will break this down for you, that shows us exactly what a conservation translocation is. So if we start from the top, we, we ask the question, is this release intentional? Um, if it is yes, great, we're on the right track. Is this, is this conservation, is conservation the primary objective? Yes, and that's all a conservation translocation is. It is simply an intentional release of organisms for conservation benefit, and that is what I'm talking about today. But we can get really, really intense and dig down into different types of conservation translocation. So are they released within their historical range? Um, if yes, it's called a population restoration. Are we releasing them into a population of existing conspecifics? So into a population of existing animals of the same species. Um, and then this is called a reinforcement versus what's called a, a classic reintroduction, which is a term that you probably have heard. A reintroduction is animal that is released into an area where it was uh, recently existing, but became extinct. So, and then we can have something called a conservation introduction, which is really fascinating. And you're introducing them into an area to fill an ecological niche, but you're releasing them into a, in, into a area which is not a part of their historical range, which is becoming actually more popular these days because of climate change and just different human effects. The, their, their native environment is no longer suitable and we can't get it back um, in time to save the species. So we're gonna release them to an environment that is suitable. But again, today we are focusing on conservation translocation. General term, we're releasing them um, intentionally for conservation benefits. And specifically, we are talking only about animals that are bred in captivity. We are not talking about animals that have been bred in the wild um, and then uh, translocated to a, to a different environment. Simply captive to wild. And we're talking about captive bred species because of this lovely quote from Michael Sole. He was a really popular conservationist um, in the, the 80s, the 70s, 80s, 90s. And he did some really wonderful research on species conservation. And he had this wonderful quote that came out in the 80s that said, to avoid mass extinctions, around 2,000 terrestrial vertebrates need to be captive bred in the next 200 years. Currently, people estimate that this is two to three times actually that estimate. So we need to be really captive breeding our species in order to save them from extinction. <clears throat> but you can probably see from this image why this would be an issue. So you could theorize why raising them captivity can cause certain problems. So from this image, we can see um, they're potentially getting fed unnatural foods. They're getting fed from a human in an unnatural way maybe introduction of diseases. Um, and then through my own research, I found from previous studies, the number one issue with these captive rearing to release to the wild programs was maladaptive behaviors that these animals create in captivity. So they are not foraging correctly. They are not avoiding their predators correctly. <clears throat> they can't find mates. They're not reproducing. Um, and they're finding that from these maladaptive behaviors, they're having poor survival post-release. So what is the solution to this? It's something called behavior-based management. The general definition of this is the use and consider consideration of behavior in conservation practice. I have two different types that we're going to slightly talk about today. Active behavior-based management is where you're actively training the animals to elicit certain behaviors. So you're training them to recognize their predator and subsequently avoid them. That's an active type of behavior-based management. Or passive 
behavior-based management, it's more like enrichment. You're simply providing the environment <clears throat> to the animal so they can elicit more natural behaviors or prevent them from adapting to maladaptive behaviors. So like this is an example right here is you're simply providing them with natural foods in the natural way that they would find them so they can practice foraging, things like this. So I'm gonna take you into my first chapter first. We're only gonna do two chapters of my dissertation today. We're gonna to look at the first chapter where I looked at the literature so I, I can give you a big basis of actually what is out there in terms of behavior-based management. So my real focus was, I wanted to ask the question of what factors, including behavior-based management techniques are influencing captive bred bird survival within the first year post-release. So I looked at any bird species, across the world in any region, if they had some kind of translocation literature and they had it within my specifications, I included it in my study. This is possible because if you look at the graph right here to the left, it is showing you that the amount of translocation information that we have in the last few decades has started to octuple. It is really just taken off in terms of a field and the amount of research and information we have out there. And so I looked at tons and tons of literature to see what's going on. So the way I did this, first thing, I needed to define my variables. I needed to define what is a behavior-based management variable and how often is it being used so that it's actually logical to include it in my study. So we're going to first look at our active behavior variables. So remember, this is actively training those individuals to elicit certain types of behavior. So the first one is foraging training. This is a really great example of a picture of it. You're actively training those captive bred individuals to forage for a specific food or forage in a certain way in a certain area. Another one is migration training. You're using some kind of human-led guidance on a specific migratory route. So these aircrafts are, you've probably seen them in movies or some kind of article somewhere. This is a great example of this. Hazard training, so you're training the um, animals to avoid specific man-made environmental hazards. Really great example of this, and this is um, is the California condor was actually running into power lines, and so they put live wire in their um, in their captive environments so they could train them to avoid these environmental hazards. Anti-predator training, which is what I'm going to talk a lot about today, you're training them specifically to recognize and avoid their natural or non-native predators. This has a very specific flow to it, and we're going to go into that a little bit more when we discuss my second chapter. Really fascinating, really sometimes hilarious research on how they get these animals to recognize their predators. So a lot of scaring animals to save them. Uh, vocal training, you're introducing some kind of played recordings of wild con specifics. So they're learning a lot of birds. Um, their song is very integral to how they survive and how they reproduce. So playing recordings of wild con specifics. Some more passive behavioral variables, again, just kind of introducing them to natural things that they find in the wild. Puppet rearing them. So having a caretaker, as we can see in the left picture down here, this is a California condor being puppet reared. <clears throat> just to prevent them from imprinting on humans. You have some kind of mentored rear young where it's any stage during their development, you're letting them socialize with uh, conspecifics. Um, so the some animals of, their, um, of the same species. And it's better to do with wild conspecifics too. Um, and acclimation cage. So this is really um, interesting where they put up a cage right at their release site so they can acclimate to the site sounds, temperatures, um, all the stimuli of their natural environment. So sort of acclimating them before they get released. And then wild food exposure. So like I said before, you're giving them their natural foods um, in the in sort of a natural way that they would find them in the wild so they can practice foraging and, and hunting too. To create the best statistical models I possibly could, you have to combine them with non-behavioral variables um, that, that I got from the literature that said they would, that these are the ones that really had an effect on bird survival post-release. Uh, so things like conspecific presence. So are you doing a reintroduction where there's no conspecifics where you're releasing them? Are you doing a reinforcement where you're sort of bolstering an existing population? Percent juvenile, so factoring in age somehow. <laughs> in situ, fancy term for did you do any type of management in the release area where you're trying to alleviate that species cause of decline? 
Um, so this is like things like habitat management and space invasive species control. Are you releasing them into a protect, protected area? Are you providing any type of post-release food aid? So are you um, giving them, you know, some berries and seeds right after they get released? Or if you're dealing with a predator species, are you providing them with some kind of, um, you know, carcass or something like that after a release? So things like this. And then number of animal released at a, um, a time. So it there are a lot of uh, factors going on. If you're releasing only like three individuals to the wild, they tend to survive very poorly due to many different reasons. So I recorded always what was the number um, of release. So I, when I was looking to the literature, I looked at um, all the animals had to be captured, bred, and reared. And they, all these articles had to include survival estimates within that first year post-release. I was really looking at that first year because if you're going to have an animal with a maladapted behavior, it can't forage properly, it can't avoid its predators, you're probably going to see the worst of the mortality within that first year post-release as they're acclimating to their environment. So that's what I was really looking for. And really this first year post-release or the first like six to like 18 months is a hard adjustment for a lot of animals and where you classically see the highest mortality anyways. This is a little really complicated, but I'm just gonna go over the basics for you. How I found my literature, I took endangered species lists from the IUCN that told me that these animals were either captive bred or they're released in some way. I put that into the web of science and I filtered by my criteria. So I ended up at first with a little over 20,000 papers. I had to filter by title and abstract filtered some more by did they include this first year survival data? And then based off of certain things, did they have complete data? Basically, I came up with 91 translocation events from 76 papers that I used in my analysis. So I know this looks really complicated. I just wanted to give you an example of what my results look like. I did a multi-model inference. It's basically you rank models to see which one of these variables is likely having an impact on spurred survival in that first year post-release. And the ones highlighted in yellow were my ones that had the most support. So, and we can show you those in more detail on the next slide, but this is kind of what my results looked like. So again, I know it looks intimidating, but I want you to focus on the, the highlighted numbers. This is what was really important. So these are my best models. These were the variables that were giving the most support for having potential impact on bird survival within that first year post-release. So we have things like wild food exposure. Um, and if we look at it, the estimate is point two. So what this is really saying is potentially if you are giving your population of captive bred birds wild food exposure, so exposing them to some kind of their native food in a native way before release, you could potentially increase their survival by 20% within that first year. That's a huge, huge number. So if we look at protected areas, 17% approval. If you combined wild food exposure with post-release food aid, so again, giving them some extra food after they get released, you could potentially combine some, maybe getting it up to around 20-ish percent improving survival. Same thing with improving, um, doing some kind of in-situ management. So dealing with the threats before they're released can increase that survival, acclimating them to their release site and providing some kind of um, anti-predator training. So really exciting. We um, saw some very, very cool results. Some were not surprising, others were surprising. So things like dealing with their threats before they're released or releasing them into a protected area, not so surprising. This has been shown to increase the survival of birds post-release anyways, but things like behavior-based management really were having a positive effect, introducing them to their native foods, acclimating them at the release site, and providing potentially some anti-predator training all pot potentially have an effect on bird survival um, in that first year post-release. So really cool. This is just giving some more evidence-based information to their those managers. So again, just like my results said, so protections and in-situ management, wild of food exposure, potentially because it decreases food handling time when they get out into the wild, which lowers their predation risk, improves potentially gut morphology because they're eating more of their natural foods, um, and then providing acclimation at the re release site and in-situ management are all increasing site fidelity. So that means that they're sticking to their release site right after they get re released and they don't disperse, which 
classically in the past with a lot of these birds, if they disperse really far, they have more chance of dying. So all really cool um, uh, things that I did for my first chapter, looking to the literature, and it kind of confirmed the positive impact of behavior-based management and made me want to do it on my own population of birds, which is what I did next. This is my chapter two. This is where I raised my own population of birds and did some type of behavior-based management on them. I did anti-predator training specifically. So now I'm gonna give you the real rundown of what a classic type of anti-predator training is. So it involves something called classical conditioning. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Pavlov's dogs, where he sort of trained them to, whenever they heard a bell ring, they would salivate even though if they didn't see the food. That's exactly what my form of anti-predator training involves. And it's a very classic form of anti-predator training. So if you look at the image on the right, I can kind of explain this in more detail. So if you have a captive raised bird, you're going to show them some kind of neural stimulus. This neural stimulus is neutral stimulus, sorry, neutral stimulus. <clears throat> um, that is maybe some kind of predator cue. Maybe it's a predator call, which in the in this instance is, or it's the silhouette of a predator flown overhead or some kind of rustling of leaves as some kind of cue, basically a cue where they should uh, um, associate it with a predator. But since they were raised in captivity, this guy's a little confused. So in the next training session, you pair the neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. So you're showing them their predator. Maybe you're instigating chase. You're trying to get them to fear the predator, basically which causes some kind of unconditioned response, in this case, flee. And so the next time, hopefully, after some anti-predator training, they, the neutral stimulus becomes conditioned, that they associate it with a condition. Now they have this conditioned response to the conditioned stimulus. So for mine, you can see right here, this is the hawk, the live hawk I used in my anti-predator training. Um, this is an education hawk that a local falconer in the Virginia area let me borrow. And so I had this hawk um, and this guy was used as my unconditioned stimulus. And I showed him to my robins and I'll show you that in just a second. And a very, very effective in doing anti-predator training was using this education hawk. Okay. So just some background on the type of tests that I am specifically doing and including with my anti-predator training. So we have a lot of information on if anti-predator training is effective in helping um, the survival of certain types of species. So if you see from some previous research, mammals, fish, and reptiles are 2.14 times more likely to survive if they were conditioned with anti-predator training compared to their unconditioned counterparts, which is really exciting. However, birds in a lot of the research showed a mixed response. Um, this may be due to a lot of different reasons, um, but that was part of why I wanted to figure out in my research is why this was happening. So this is... <clears throat> This is a type of giving up density test. So I wanted to pair my anti-predator training with foraging behavior. So if we look at this image right here, I'm going to explain to you the type of test I did, which goes along with this third bullet point. So it's a theory called giving up density. And basically what it says is the amount of food left behind in a patch should be affected by missed opportunity costs, predation costs, and metabolic costs of each patch. So I set up in this image right here, two foraging patches to show you examples of this. So this little robin right down here is trying to choose between these two foraging patches, the one right up, up top with lots of trees and the one down below with one tree and maybe a little bit more open air. And so there's a predator in the area. And so they have predation costs potentially uh, between these two foraging patches. We can see here that maybe their missed opportunity costs there really isn't any because the amount of food they have at each patch is equal. They have three worms at each patch. So there's no really missed opportunity costs. One patch does not have more food than the other. There's no real metabolic costs. Each patch has the same temperature. There's nothing causing the bird to be too cold or too hot at one or other patch, which causes them to have to use their metabolism in different ways. So really no metabolic costs. But they do have different predation costs 
because one patch, the top one, offers more coverage from the predator than the one on the bottom. And so logically, the robin with lots of experience with their na native predators should choose the top patch to forage from. So, however, my hypothesis was, I thought that naive robins that are reared in captivity um, will not have these natural anti-predator ability and they will kind of randomly choose patches, even if one patch has more predation cost over the next. So I wanted to look at their vigilance behavior. So how much are they looking around for predators? How efficient they are at foraging? Because if they're looking down more often and then looking up um, and they're not very efficient at it, they have more risk of being predated. And their risk analysis behavior. So are they choosing safer patches over um, more dangerous patches before and after anti-predator training? So this is the test I wanted to do. So really the fun stuff. I actually reared 60 American Robins in the summer of 2021, um, but only 46 made it into my study due to various health issues or just were not suited for research. Um, and I identified them individually with colored bands and they all received identical care. Um, you can see here, this top image is my little robins. These are my um, more nestling, two fledgling type uh, age of robins where they're in these makeshift incubators that I made. Um, and they had a little um, um, heating pad underneath them and a way to keep their humidity right. And you can see all my food that I was feeding them. And then this um, bottom image is where they transitioned when they are fledglings to start stretching out, start perching more. And then when they got to more adult weight, they were actually transitioned. I don't have a picture of it, but to outdoor enclosures. Um, and that's where they were held until they were eventually released after the studies. So this is the giving up density test. So this is how I measure vigilance, foraging efficiency, and patch choice. Um, so I made this outdoor enclosure. Um, and this is an image kind of of my outdoor enclosure that I put together. Um, and you can see my safe, middle, and danger patches. Safe was the safest because it had cover. Middle was middle safe because it doesn't have cover, but it's the fastest route possible to the safe patch and to the cover. And danger is the most dangerous because it's the furthest away from the safe patch and also does not have cover. Um, inside these bins, they have the identical amount of what were called super worms. If you've ever worked with mealworms, it's like that, but they're giant um, and robins love them. And they were getting fed this throughout their entire rearing process. Um, and they had little, had little cameras above each one of the patches to monitor their behavior and how much of these uh, super worms they ate and a GoPro camera right here monitoring their flight behavior. Um, and so what I did for these tests is I flew a hawk silhouette over the enclosure right when the test began to initiate that predation, to elicit that fear. And then they were sort of freely allowed to move between these patches and forage for about 30 minutes. And I recorded their behaviors on all my recording devices. I did one of these tests before anti-predator training and one of these tests after anti-predator training to see if there's any change in behavior and foraging. And I did two total anti-predator trainings. So each individual robin went through two anti-predator trainings, unfortunately, with that live hawk. <laughs> Okay, and real fast, I was going to include my um, a video, but my uh, PowerPoint kept shutting down. So I have it separately for you guys. So I'm just gonna share that with you real fast so you can see an example of the video. Okay, so this is an example of what the video recording looks like. Um, I can make this a tad bigger. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so this is what example of what my video recording looked like. This is the safe patch video that you are looking at. And I just wanted to show you of what I had to, I analyzed a little over 300 hours of animal behavior video. And I had a really lovely application where I was able to record all of their behaviors and then further do my analysis. But this is what I looked at. There we go. We may 
be not working, but we shall try. Hmm. There we go. So you guys can kind of see, this is the thrilling video that I looked at uh, over 300 hours. And, um, but so I recorded everything from their vigilance behavior. So looking upwards, scanning their environment, foraging, uh, any kind of rest behavior, how much time they spent in each one of the um, patches. So here we go. Here comes one of my Robins. He's about to eat one of the super worms. Hurry up, Scott. There we go. Perfect. Got to eat that lovely super worm. Awesome. There we go. Perfect. So I just wanted to give you guys an example of what that looked like. And I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. There we go. So from the 300 hours of video that I looked into, I was able to do my analysis. And these are some of the results. Um, so if you look at this image right here, you can kind of see um, with these arrows, what I was trying to explain here is in the safe patch and in the danger patch, there was a significant increase in vigilance after anti-predator training. There was an increase in the middle patch. However, it was not significant. Um, and then there was an increase in foraging efficiency in the safe patch after um, anti-predator training. And so what this told me was anti-predator training was kind of having this indiscriminate increase, causing this indiscriminate increase in vigilance across the board. So no matter if they're in the danger middle or safe patch, they increased their vigilance after anti-predator training. They were just freaking out. <laughs> um, and so it it did not really improve the anti the anti predator behavior of a robin in terms of risk analysis. So potentially they were being too vigilant in a safer patch, which can also affect survival, which is something interesting that we should look into when we're doing these anti predator trainings. However, they did have this sort of multitasking behavior. So they got more efficient with their vigilance in the safe patch or with their foraging in the safe patch. And this is because they were able to do this multitasking behavior where they, um, before anti-predator training, they would hold a worm in their mouth, but they would still be looking down. And after anti-predator training, they would be holding the worm in their mouth and they would look up and start scanning again. So they're doing this kind of multitasking behavior. So getting a little bit more efficient. Um, but there was no significant differences in patch choice before and after anti-predator training. So we need to focus more of the research in the future on improving our trainings. And so they can have a little bit more of a discriminant when, so they're not doing too much anti-predator training in more safer patches and they can focus on foraging. So there's just some acknowledgements of the people who helped me out to have my research done. So again, that was just two chapters of my dissertation, but I wanted to give you guys a good overview of uh, my reintroduction and translocation type of research. So some fun results came out of that research. Um, and if you'd like, some of my work has already been published and I can send you guys my published articles already. Um, and now I'm gonna switch it over a little bit uh, before we go into questions to Habitat Connectivity at Wild Virginia. So now I switched a little bit from doing wildlife conservation in terms of captive breeding and reintroduction to doing more a little bit of the advocacy, getting the habitat correct for this wildlife. It was a very logical step for me because we cannot reintroduce or we cannot translocate these individuals to environments if their environment is not suitable for them. And habitat connectivity is a huge reason for this. Um, are they able to move? Do they have access to core habitats, access to more individuals in different populations? It's very, very logical. And it was one of the key components I found when doing my PhD research that inhibited us to having um, better conservation overall. So I'm happy to be here as the director of Habitat Connectivity at Wild Virginia. Just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of the important concepts of Habitat Connectivity. So we are one of the highest risk states, Virginia, in terms of wild, uh, wildlife vehicle conflict. So this is any type of uh, wildlife vehicle crashes, but also if someone sort of maneuvers out of the way around an animal and it causes some damage or some crash, um, that's what we call wild, uh, wildlife vehicle conflict. But we are the ha ninth highest 
risk state in the nation for this. We have a one in 78 chance of hitting an animal when we go out on the roads. Um, and just to really hit it home, West Virginia, our neighbor is the number one highest risk state in terms of wildlife vehicle conflict and drivers have a one in 38 chance. Um, and this costs a lot of money. Um, this uh, These types of conflict cost Americans over $8 billion every year. Virginia, for specifically, um, I know the data for deer, which is our number one reason why we get into these wildlife vehicle conflicts. Um, around 60,000 uh, deer wildlife vehicle conflicts happen every year in Virginia, and that costs Virginia's um, around $533 million per year. So very risky and very expensive. But some things that we are doing about this and some successes is in 2020, Virginia was among the first states to enact legislation to protect habitat connectivity and wildlife quarters. And it, <laughs> this legislation made it possible to um, have collaboration between a lot of state agencies and some nonprofit agencies to come together and create the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan, which looks at things like how do we prioritize habitat corridor and connectivity projects? How do we prioritize more wildlife crossings? Something that's also helping this is what's called the Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, enacted in November 2021. This was giving a lot more funding incentives to more states and more agencies to do more habitat connectivity legislation um, because this is providing the funding for these types of projects. So very, very exciting. We have opportunities for funding and we have legislation in place and we have a good base to start off with more habitat connectivity projects in Virginia. So some countermeasures we could do and some things we can fund with these with this new federal and some state funding is things like more signage. So um, some really cool signs are changeable message signs that maybe during really high um, wildlife movement seasons can be enacted maybe during certain times of the day that we have more wildlife vehicle conflict. Um, or maybe a flashing sign that flashes when it's connected to some kind of detector that detects some kind of large animal movement like a bear or a deer. And so uh, the uh, research council with VDOT, the Virginia Department of Transportation, did a lot of really wonderful research on these types of countermeasures and their effectiveness. And a lot of these changeable signs and the flashing signs had a good impact on wildlife um, reducing those wildlife crashes, but also just in general, having them reduce driver speed. And then some of the more common ones that people know about are overpasses and underpasses. Overpasses are much more popular out on the West Coast, in Canada, in Europe. Um, our wildlife in Virginia have a little bit different migration and movement patterns. So really our most effective are underpasses. And we have a lot of these underpasses already in place, things like culverts, bridges, and what would be really effective for us is enacting some type of fencing. Again, the Research Council associated with VDOT did some research on I-66 near Charlottesville and found that when they put up this fencing to direct wildlife to two existing underpasses, it actually reduced crashes by 92%, these wildlife vehicle crashes. So that's really great research and things that we need to focus on in Virginia. So for Wild Virginia and specifically, these are just some ideas that we are working with at Wild Virginia in terms of our focus for habitat connectivity. So in terms of our areas of focus, advocacy, collaboration, and education. So advocating for to leverage more state and federal funding. So we have these opportunities that the that bipartisan infrastructure law, we have these opportunities we just need to apply and we need to get this federal funding and leverage more state funding as well. But um, to gain support and pressure legislators to create regulatory framework requiring VDOT to include wildlife crossings in their infrastructure plan. So right now it is simply suggested, it is not required. We would love to have some kind of language in there that there's some kind of triggering mechanism that triggers VDOT to include wildlife crossings in their infrastructure plan. So things like flooding regulations or just simply high numbers of wildlife vehicle conflict in a certain area. Collaborating, so always collaborating with governmental non and non-governmental organizations to really look at and prioritize what are the connectivity high areas that we need to focus on in Virginia and get those projects done together. 
and collect uh, more habitat connectivity data. So this is again, collaboration work. So working with organizations that are on the ground and collecting this connectivity data. So things like wildlife vehicle crash data, biodiversity corridor data, easement data, um, things like the status of culverts and bridges in terms of allowing for terrestrial and aquatic passage. So working with organizations to get this data into one location to make it really easy for legislators and for the public to access so they know in their area where there are priorities. So these are just some of my ideas for now. There's a lot more um, coming for sure, but that is all I have for you guys. So thank you so much for having me. I am now open for questions. Thank you so much for being here. Wow, no questions? <laughs> Wow, you guys have no questions? Any questions? Really ask anything. Oh, here we go, Q&A. There we go. Okay, we got some questions coming. Okay, we have one question. Did I notice thinning of my birds during anti predator training? That's a great question. I did not. Um, it was really health of the birds was like a top priority. I am a wildlife rehabilitator, so I have permits to do this stuff. Um, so the, the first priority, you know, I wanted to get this research done, but really the first priority was the health of these birds and making sure they were okay for their eventual release to the wild because they were released. Um, so I monitored their weight quite um, persistently, and I made sure that they had lots and lots of food all the time, uh, but no thinning um, during the process, really no adverse health effects. There was maybe one or two um, that came down with a pulmonary uh, parasite, but it's, it's a little bit common in American robins when they eat earthworms. I didn't actively feed them earthworms, but they were out in a natural enclosure. And so earthworms were able to get in. So some of them had health problems from that and they were removed from the study so they could receive the care that they needed. Um, but I was pretty vigilant about their health. Okay. Okay. About how many birds does Wildlife Center release every year? So I um I did not work, sorry, I did not include that. I did not work at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. I actually worked with a wildlife center called um Diva Crows. <laughs> I left my brain for a minute. Diva Crows. Um, they actually are in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, my number, um, I had my number on robins. So I had 60 robins come in for the whole season. Uh, in terms of total birds, I'm not quite sure. It was quite high though. Um, cause mine alone was 60 and we had so many other birds coming in. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite a lot, definitely in the hundreds that, uh, the wildlife center dealt with, but, um, my, my birds had a pretty good percentage in terms of, you know, how many we got in and how many we, we could release. Um, I think my release rate was pretty high, but, um, like in the 90, 95 percentile. But um, a lot of the times with wildlife centers, we get in the sickest animals and it's hard, but mine are pretty good. Robins are pretty hardy. Um, okay. How did the predator training work with your birds? I know you use the education hawk, but how did they learn to be afraid of it? Oh, that's a great question. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> I showed you the classical conditioning. So what I did is I, I put them in an enclosure that was very close to the hawk. They didn't see the hawk at first. So what happened is I had this kind of like removable shield basically that I put the robins in this enclosure. They were able to acclimate and kind of do their thing. It was a familiar enclosure to them. 
And then I started anti-predator training. And so what I did was I flew a hawk silhouette over their enclosure and I played robin alarm calls. So wild robin alarm calls. And right after the hawk silhouette was shown, <clears throat> I removed it and I immediately raised the shield so they could view the hawk. And generally the hawk did some kind of like scary behavior, like trying to come at the robins um, or simply just like moving seemed to be enough to make the robins kind of react um, and that was their anti-predator training. It was not for long because I had to <clears throat> monitor the robin's distress. So um, they were only in view with the hawk for about um, a minute. And so after that, they were removed and the training was done. But previous studies have shown even just that short amount of time is enough for them to start eliciting um, uh, natural behaviors. Okay, so um, how have I tracked them since release? So I just banded them. Um, they were recorded in a um, state banding process. So they've just been banded. I didn't do any type of um, tracking. My goal, my research was to really monitor their behavior of their survival. That's the next step in the process is to monitor their survival after release. I had my in research interrupted due to COVID, so I didn't have enough time and um, resources were really limited in terms of funding to get tracking devices for animals. I did my research in 2021 and I was supposed to actually have my research done in 2020 um, in Brazil, actually. I was supposed to do it on parrots in Brazil, but um, and I was gonna track them then, but the it got shut down due to COVID. So I had to reorganize my research to do it in Virginia, actually. So I didn't have enough time to track, but um, they are banded. So if they get caught, caught in any kind of misting or bird banding project, they could be recorded. Okay, what do you think about the elimination of parasitic birds such as the brown-headed cowbird? About 20 years ago, they showed up um, on the top of Afton and were doing tremendous damage to the breeding of our native species and especially cavity nesting birds. They were proactively eliminated and haven't seen. Yes, I, so, okay. <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about this. I am probably more of an ecologist than I am um, like an animal rights person. I've seen, um, and I've been a wildlife rehabilitator for a really long time. I actually do advocate for a lot of this invasive type of removal. Um, cowbirds especially can do this really ho terrible harm. Um, and it really does impede natural populations from, um, existing. And it is, they are that is able to happen due to humans and i do believe in intervention such as eliminating them um if you can do any type of translocation project where you're translocating them somewhere you can do that but it tends to be way too expensive and not available um so unfortunately i am a little bit for it because i am more of a natural ecologist than i am um, a, a human rights or animal rights person so i am for that Um, what was the survival rate for your robins after release? So I actually don't know. Um, I, I, because I did not track them, I don't know, but, um, I have heard from a couple of researchers at Smithsonian that they have caught my birds, um, in the year 2022. So I at least knew that like a few of them were alive in 2022, but again, I didn't have the funding to be able to track them, but that is the next step in the research. Um, were any Virginia master naturalists involved or will they in the future observation? So they could, I mean, they, they definitely could um, get my birds for sure, but they were not involved in the process of my research uh, when I was doing it now. Uh, Normal levels of our pasturing birds returned in about five to seven years, but it's great. Yeah, yeah, they can do quite a bit of harm. Um, it's very, very fascinating, but... Yeah, invasive species are one of the top um, conservation issues when it comes to bird conservation. It's definitely raised by a lot of environments like island environments. So Hawaii has a huge invasive species concern. Guam um, has a huge invasive species concern in terms of their native bird populations. So, but also, you know, on mainland too, the invasive species are a huge concern. And a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but cats are... Um, I consider them an invasive species and outdoor cats do a lot of ecological harm um, and there needs to be some kind of uh, process that protects native wildlife against that type of thing as well. So invasive species are a huge problem that I am for, definitely for their control. Yeah. 
Any other questions? That's a really Ms. great Garcia, question. There's guys. a question in the chat. Oh, yes. So it says Kai, eight years old, would like to know why the birds struggled during their training, even though you did it twice. <laughs> So a lot with what we, that's a great question. A lot with what I found was that these robins were only one generation re reared in captivity. And so they probably actually had a lot of their natural anti-predator behaviors before. So that's why we didn't really see such a dramatic shift in behavior before and after anti-predator training. Um, and um, it might have been a little bit of my study design. So my patches were about 10, five to 10 feet away from each other. And that might have not been enough to elicit more predation um, differences between each patch. And so that's something I actually recommended in my paper that when they do these um, foraging tests in relation to anti-predator training, they should have the patches much further apart to really show that like the danger patch is really out there, out in the open, and the safe patch is nice and safe and comfortable under cover and the middle is somewhere in between. Um, so that might've been one of the things behind it. But I am the first person to ever do this type of research to combine these types of foraging tests with anti-predator training. So it is just the beginning. Um, and they recommend if you're going to do some kind of uh, project, this is just another resource to give to translocation uh, managers. So if they want to do these types of tests to figure out how uh, their foraging, I do definitely recommend it in my study. So it's more of a, like a feasibility type of study. Make sure I didn't miss any other. Here we go. Um, da -da -da -da. So we got how we get SPCA to stop the process of neutering or spaying cats notching their ears, and then releasing them to the wild, and in their words, live out their natural lives. Last year, as you know, feral cats approximately eight. Yes. Yeah, they killed approximately 1.8. Uh, yeah, it's a billion birds and mammals. Um, so it's it's quite intense, uh, the effect of cats, and I hate saying it. Um, but, you know, I think there are a lot of things that we can do humanely, for sure, with cats to prevent them from impacting uh, wildlife. So... Um, that I am for. I am not for inhumanely going out and getting those cats. Um, but I think there are a lot of different things that we can do to safely and humanely um, let cats have their natural enrichment and let our natural wildlife exist as well. Thank you for the really wonderful questions. Anybody else have any other questions? Make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat. Oh, lead poisoning, yeah. Yeah, that's another problem too, for sure, for native wildlife as well. For sure, lead poisoning. When I worked at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, we saw a lot of lead poisoning. Yeah, that's a problem. For sure. Let's see. Do I have any others? Any other questions? If you would love to talk any more about this stuff, please do let me know. My email is jessica at wildvirginia.org. Please do. Oh, this was. Da, da, da. Yeah, if you would love to talk more about invasive species, for sure. For sure. Plants as well, for sure. There's a lot of issues with invasive species. Would love to. Um, invasive species control? Is that the. So is there an organization trying to stop this practice? Oh, 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 with lead poisoning, you mean? With lead poisoning, for sure. Um, there's a lot of information on, um, like, educate, educating hunters to stop using lead bullets um, and how that's in, impacting our scavengers and then how that's kind of going up the food chain, for sure. Uh, Wildlife Virginia actually does a lot of education stuff on um, lead poisoning impact. 
that I know of. And there's a lot of others. And I know um, like, you know, each state's um, like wildlife resources department should be doing it. I've heard of a lot that definitely do it. Um, just making that known out there, but in terms of regulations, not sure. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great being here. Would love to talk more. Again, my email is jessica.wildvirginia.org. Don't be shy about emailing me or talking with me or wanting to set up a meeting or anything. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh yeah, the lead poisoning, for sure. It does. That would be interesting to hear about what type of lead poisoning that is. I'm not sure which one that was, but I'd be very interested to hear about that one. Thank you so much, guys. Anybody have any other questions? Oh, the SPCA, I don't know. Are they the ones doing the lead poisoning? I have no idea. But yeah, we can talk about that at some point, but I, I do not know. Thank you. Yeah, if you guys have any other questions, again, please feel free to email me and we can chat over the phone or we can set up a um, Zoom call meeting. If you'd like to hear more about my research, please do feel free. Uh, but it was a, definitely a fun time. <laughs> and if you guys don't have any other specific questions, um, and I will log off soon. Oh, wow. Yeah, the lead poisoning refers to someone shooting the cats before they continue killing. Yeah. That's aggressive. I have no idea. That's very aggressive. That seems, I wouldn't think that the SPCA would be doing that, but you know, you never know. And I have, I don't know a lot about that issue, but I can look that up for sure. There are definitely better ways <laughs> to control cat populations than that, for sure. Because that can impact wildlife as well. So not, not good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greta.